Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Bienvenue. Merci d'être venu. My name is Lise Doucette, and I'm a journalist with the BBC. What's the job of a journalist? To bring you the news. So let me first bring you the good news. The good news is that you're all here. Uh -huh. And that sends us a message that gender parity, closing the gap, matters to all of you, to all of us. But you're saying, hey, journalists bring us bad news. And sadly, I have bad news. And why? Well, to quote a recently elected, rather famous Canadian politician, because it's 2015, or because it's 2016. Why are we here? WEF has just published its global gender gap report, and it's called the 10th anniversary. It's like being in a bad relationship, and you really don't want to celebrate your 10th anniversary. Why are we still here in 2016 discussing gender parity? And doing it at a time when WEF is telling us that we are embarking on the fourth industrial revolution. Women are still struggling to keep up with the first three revolutions. And this is a revolution that we are being told is going to transform the workplace, transform technology, make old jobs obsolete and create new ones. And it's going to get even tougher for women. But does it have to be? How can we be sure that in this revolution, women and men are going to benefit? And not just as people who work in the workplace, but men and women who are also mothers, fathers, sisters, friends, that we have a more humane way of working so that everyone can be play a role in society. It's an important conversation, and we have a very important panel, beginning with my Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister. Welcome, bienvenue. We have Cheryl Sandberg, who of course uh, is the, on the board of Facebook and also author of the very successful Lean In, and some of you may be part of the Lean In groups, and she's also a young global leader. Melinda Gates is also with us. Her official title is the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Welcome to you. Jonas Prising is the chairman and the chief executive officer of Manpower USA. Ladies and gentlemen, he was only allowed to be on this panel with one condition. When he comes back to F next year, he's going to be the CEO of Human Power. He's going to change the name. <laughs> You heard it here first. And last but not least, Zhang Xin, who's the chief executive officer and co-founder of Soho China. And that is not like a seedy district in London or a fashionable club. It is the prime real estate company operating in China. And you know what that means. Okay, let us say where we are now and where, how we can get out from where we are. Melinda Gates, you recently spoke about another report that was done called the No Ceiling full participation report, where they said that men were in the workplace 50, no, 82%, women 55%. Closing the gap, if I quote you correctly, we're not even close. Why? Well, I think, I think we need to look at um, these issues really across the broad spectrum. High, middle, low-income countries. And to me, one of the most encouraging things is that the sustainable development goals that were set by 193 United Nations countries here last fall, it was the first time that when the goals got reset, women and girls were at the absolute center of the agenda. And the reason for that is that we've all come to recognize, prime ministers, presidents, heads of companies, that if you want the world, if we want this increase in, in um, equity across the world, if you want the increase of your GDP, you've got to get the other half working and participating in the economy. And that means doing things like making sure that women participate in health and they and their children have health around the world. That's the precursor. You start there. Then they have to have decision making. That often means you've got to be able to go to school and get educated so you can then have economic opportunity and participate in society. We know that when society gets that virtuous cycle going for men and for women, 
everybody's lifted up. And so we have a blueprint now as a world of where we want to go. We have a set of goals. But to me, goals are only wishes unless you have a plan. And so I think we need to have really good repository of data, specific data to say this is where we are with women and girls around the world, just like we do in health. It's why we've made such huge progress around the world the last 10 years in health. And then we need to take specific actions as a community. And that's why I'm excited about panels like these, because we get to discuss all the issues in all of those countries. Cheryl Sandberg, what's holding women back in the workplace? Top five. Oh, you don't even need five. Um, you need a, just a few. You need one is our expectations for what is appropriate for women. What's so interesting is that culturally, our, we're so different around the world. But there's a really deep cultural similarities to our gender stereotypes, which is that men are expected to lead, to provide, to be decision makers, and women are expected to nurture. Still? Still. And that's true in the office, where we actually expect women to do more office housework. We expect more women to do more of the communal tasks in the office, and we don't reward them. And when men do favors for other people, they get broadly rewarded in the workplace. And then at home, we expect, and women continue to do, the great majority of house care, housework and childcare, even when they work full time. So having expectations that women will be results focused, contribute providers, and men will be nurturers would change a lot. The next is that along with this, we have expectations for women, and it goes with this, that they won't lead. I'm gonna do what I love to do. Men only, only men please, Raise your hand if you've been told you're too aggressive at work. Only men. Mm -hmm. There's always one or two. Don't be shy. <laughs> Women, raise your hand if you've been told somewhere in your career you're too aggressive at work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ready? Men, raise your hand if anyone's ever said to you, should you be working? Ooh. Anyone ever said that to you? Should you be working? No? <laughs> no? Okay. Women, raise your hand if anyone's ever said to you, should you be working? That's the issue. And those expectations yeah. just continue. Okay. Well, let's have a show of hands. Should women be working? Absolutely. There you well, go. They are working. They always invite the same kind of people work. to Davos. I don't know why they don't bring in a bit more of diversity. You know what is surprising? Are women still making the coffee and tea over at Manpower, doing those nurturing roles in the office? No, no, they, they're not. They're actively and extensively participating at all levels. And thanks for leading by this paradox, which was gleefully pointed out by my fellow panelists in, in our room earlier, of, of the CEO of Manpower Group coming here and talking about gender parity. But I can assure you, I'm not here to allay my, my guilt at our name, which is a brand in 80 countries for 70 years. So therefore, it might be difficult to change it, um, but rather here, because from our perspective, as we look at the millions of job seekers that come to us and that we deploy across the world, uh, we can clearly see that in many, many economies, first of all, women are more educated than, than men in terms of absolute education levels, but they're not participating at the same, same levels as women are in organizations. And at the same time, employers are complaining about skill shortages. And as part of the fourth industrial revolution, what's going to happen is that employers and countries are going to need more people with the right skills, not less. So to have women not participate when they do have, have the skills is clearly a, a sub-optimization of a massive scale. So there's that aspect of the need for women to participate to make sure that we can drive great growth. And also, of course, there is, there is a very uh, important part around the decision making that happens at Manpower Group. We fundamentally believe we'll make better business decision if we have diverse diversity in thinking and diversity of all kinds. And that requires participation um, at all levels and, of course, also an equal gender participation. That's just going to be a better business uh, for us. And you've brought in a new expression, which is a much better one than used to be called quotas or tokenism, you call it conscious inclusion for those who lead in the workplace. And I think I should point out here that the kind of attitudes that Sheryl Sandberg was talking about are held not just by men, but sadly also by women. Absolutely. It's, they're held on both sides. So this is not pointing, with all due respect to the men on the panel, our very gender balanced panel here at WEF, that it is women, we are also at fault for holding those ideas. So it's got to be, people have to think about this and actively make it happen. It's not going to happen organically. Justin Trudeau, you 
made headlines worldwide when at your first press conference where you rolled out your, let me call it the 50-50 cabinet, the first gender balance cabinet in Canadian history, and you were asked, why that, why that gender balance, Mr. Prime Minister? And you said, because it is 2015. You received a lot of plaudits for that. But because it is 2015, 2015 in Canada also means that Canada is twice the global average for women learning about $8,000 less than men for doing equivalent work. And I looked at the ratings, the global gender ratings in the WEF study, which I urge you to read. Read, read. Canada's still 30. We're not doing that great for a country which talks about its greatness. What are you going to do? Well, there's, there's a lot of hard work to do. And uh, the first part is recognizing it. And you know, I was obviously pleased when people took notice of our gender balanced cabinet. Uh, but people have to know that before I could say because it's 2015, an awful lot of hard work went into 2012, 2013, mm. 2014 to get to that place. Uh, we used uh, social media and email blasts uh, as a political campaign uh, to reach out to communities uh, with a campaign called Ask Her to Run. Uh, telling uh, people to ask prominent women, uh, you know, hard workers in the community, people they knew, people who had uh, contributors, contributions to make, uh, people who just thought they might be able to make a difference, uh, to think about running for office. Because study after study has shown uh, that if you uh, ask a man uh, if he wants to run for office, his first question is likely to be, well, do I have to wear a tie every day? Uh, and if you ask a woman if she wants to run for office, her first question is usually, really, why me? And, and that idea that, uh, do you really think I'm qualified for it? And you have to ask more often, which, uh, you know, honestly is, is really frustrating. So we said, okay, if we know we have to ask more often, let's ask more often. And we, uh, we got people to recommend uh, friends, neighbors, in some cases themselves, uh, and then we followed up with them and we asked them, we talked about uh, running, and I personally uh, convinced uh, a number of extraordinary women uh, to step forward, uh, along with a number of extraordinary men, to step forward into public office at a time when politics can be very, very divisive. And I have to say, uh, well, people here at the, the World Economic Forum know well Christia Freeland, uh, who is uh, internationally renowned. It took an awful lot of arm twisting uh, before uh, she decided, because of family reasons, because of personal and professional reasons, that uh, she should take this leap. And quite frankly, all of Canada and all of the world should be very happy she did, because she's doing an extraordinary job um, as a, as a trade minister, uh, but also as a strong woman with a really important voice on the world stage. But even with that effort, and even with that in Canada, the percentage of the House in the House is 26%. That's 1% more than Afghanistan. Yes. So I think we still we still have to do to do better. But 6% more than the United States. Yeah. Mm. But. Part of that, therefore, hmm. I, I don't get to control who gets elected to the House, but I do get to pick who gets to sit in government. And hmm. uh, the leadership decision of saying, well, you know what, I'm going to make sure that I can choose 50-50. Uh, and, you know, the lead up to our announcement of that cabinet, there were a lot of people making, oh, you know, these quotas are bad, it should be merit-based, uh, you know, you shouldn't be forcing it. Uh, and then once I displayed the cabinet, uh, nobody talked about merit anymore because the people in our cabinet, men and women, are extraordinarily high qualified. And I have to say Canadians and the world will be watching that gender balance cabinet because symbolism, symbols matter, symbolism is important, but substance is much better. This was to be a panel which mainly focused on the workplace, but I think you'd all agree that if this is to change, there's got to be leadership in the workplace, leadership politically, and leadership around the world, and of course I should say leadership right in the home as well, between the relationship between men and women and children. But a lot of our experiences here are talking about Western cultures. Let's bring in the world's real powerhouse, China, and Chiang Sen. And I have to say, I was doing a little bit of research before here, and I put into Google, sorry, um, China gender gap, and up comes an article on gender gap real estate, which is Jin's area. I thought, wow, I hit the jackpot. Guess what I found out, ladies and gentlemen? Crucial information. They did a survey in real estate, and they asked people, what would you like in your house? How about kitchen appliances? Well, you'll be surprised to hear that 32% of single men thought kitchen appliances were the most important thing in their home, and only 21% of women. 
And when it came to <laughs> granite countertops, come on, who doesn't want a granite countertop? 24% of men said, yes, I want it. And only 11% of women. What is changing in the homes we buy? But what is changing, more importantly, in the real estate market? Everyone talks about the Chinese economic boom, but many people don't, and even in China they don't talk about, I understand, why women are not benefiting, except for high-profile examples like you in this economic boom. I think, actually, China is a, a slightly different situation, because we went through a cultural revolution. You know, and th those were the days when Mao said women can raise half the sky. Mm. So I grew up with seeing every woman work. My mother worked, my aunt worked, everybody worked. There was no women stay at home. So what happened is that today, actually with the last 30 years of reform, you're seeing two sides of the country. If you see the state-owned sectors or governments, you really don't see many women. But if you see the private sector, which is the vibrant, the, the creative side, and it's the driver of the economy, there are an awful lot of self-made women entrepreneurs. I run the real estate company, I can tell you this, is sales, our sales team, that are all people based on commission, so I see each sales as like an a, a, a entrepreneur. The best performing uh, sales are always women. So it just makes me think that women are more natural to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> Do you, so you, the kind of attitudes that Cheryl was talking about in the raising of hands, if we did that same survey in China, mm. you know, how many men think women don't work, how many men have been told they're too aggressive, how many women, would you get the same results? I, I mean, I've, I've oh, done She it. must have done it. I've mm. done it in mm. China. In China. the aggressive thing, you get the same results. The same. I don't know about the, I don't know if I remember mm. the working one. And given that you're working in real estate and you run a very powerful company, what would, what would be the first thing you think would have to change to start addressing the gap? Because I'm sure there still are, are gaps um, in, in terms of gender parity in the workplace, despite what you've just said. I mean, we, in our company, the senior management, it's naturally 50-50. Actually, it wasn't because of deliberate, not like the prime minister had a quota, 50-50. It just happened that way. And of course, uh, the company is run by me and my husband, 50-50 partnership. Mm -hmm. So that, and then some jobs are more for men, like construction jobs, engineers going around the construction. You don't really get so many women who want to do that job. But also there's some jobs like sales are naturally women. So I think it's just, if you do not have the bias and prejudice, and you just leave it to the natural choice, you probably would end up 50-50. I don't know. I have, I have to disagree with that. I, uh, in one of the challenges we have in Canada is, is uh, there's a lot of, lot of young people wanting to go into the trades. And uh, yes, you know, right now there are a few more men than women, but you see uh, a tremendous amount of young women who are excited about I mean, I went to a group of welders at one point, and uh, you know, one was proud to wear a pink helmet, and then I talked to her, and she was actually the only one taking the underwater welding course. She was the only one pushing herself further and, and, and harder than everyone else, and all the guys were looking up to her, uh, not just because she was in a non-traditional role, but because she was, she was owning it, and she was excelling, and just... I'd like to get to a point where nobody notices that there might be jobs that more women do or more men do and just uh, look at, at, at qualifications. And in order to do that, we have to be really thoughtful about how we shape society in a, in a deliberate and, and uh, you know, willful way. I, and I would add to that, we need to look at women's time because it's, it's a, if you have the expectation that women want to work and should work and 50-50 in the workforce, you have to also look at their time and where it's spent. There's a huge amount of unpaid labor all over the world. So every single day, if you look at the global statistics, women spend four and a half more hours than a man every day at home with tasks at home. They are expected to care for the elderly. They're expected to care for the children. If somebody gets sick, if you, if you interview Harvard MBAs two years ago, they did this coming out. Men and women had the same expectations about working. But when you said, if you choose to get married and have children, who will take the child to the doctor, both the men and the woman said the woman would leave her job for an hour to go take the child to the doctor. Yeah. So we have these 
these unwritten expectations of women. So what we have to do is recognize what our expectations are and then redistribute the workload. I, I love some of the things that Cheryl talks about in Lean In about you really have to have a conversation inside your own family of what are our roles and expectations and who's going to do what. And if you don't have great policies, not maternal leave policies, but family leave policies so that a man and a woman can take time off. We know that if a man takes time off at the birth of his child, he spends more time with that child and more time on household chores. That's a redistribution. You want to talk about the country that has it wrong the most? The United States. We need to change this in the United States. We only have two states today that have a family leave policy, and even those are skewed. We ought to have it in all 50 states. The tech companies are leading with it, but this has to change. Mm. But it is, but there is, there is. We have a toddler. There's a toddler wage gap in the U.S. There's a toddler yeah. wage gap in the yeah. U.S. and different expectations. Little boys in home do fewer chores and get paid more than little girls. No, this is true. We assign our chores to our children in the United States, and it can be worse in other places of the world where the boys are taking out the trash, it takes less time than cleaning the dishes, and they're getting higher allowances. And so we start out in our homes with these very different expectations, and the time spent on these tasks is incredibly important and, ve and very different. But this is, this is really shocking. Back to, because it's 2015, never have we lived in a world where we are so educated, so well connected, know so much about the world. And I have to just anecdotally, I mean, men in this generation do take, are more active in their children's lives. They do, at least they recognize the need, and women recognize uh, the need to share, and yet we're still ha having these conversations. If the statistics are correct, that something like 33% of households in the United States, the main breadwinner, to use an old phrase, is a woman but she may also be a woman doing work in the home? She still does more in the home. Mm. That's what the data shows very okay. clearly. Yeah, and, and I would, would echo Melinda's, Melinda's observations because when we look at pipelines, when you, look at, you focus on women's participation in anything as a percentage, you sometimes don't make the effort to go in and look at what does that percentage mean. And what we found, you know, if we just focus on percentages, you can tick the box and feel good. But the percentages belie the fact that they're breakpoints in women's lives. Yes. Mm. When the pressures build up too much, at a certain age, even companies that do very well on a percentage per per point, they, they'll have 50% of the workforce up until a certain point, and then there's no migration into more senior leadership roles. And why is that? And, and we can see those breakpoints very much correlating with breakpoints that you would expect in life, you know, when, when, when the first children are coming, and or when children are there, more income has been, been earned, but the pressures are building up again. So breakpoints between, the, there's a first breakpoint around 30, 28, 30, and then a second, depending on which culture, of course, where mm. you are in the world. But in the developed countries, you can clearly see breakpoints. So we think, but they don't have to be breakpoints if you're not penalized at work of when you not. go back. Absolutely. That it's recognized that women will go away because, unfortunately, one thing so far we can't change is that the women will give birth to the child and will need a certain amount but, of time off. And what you need to, but what you need to think about is that there are breakpoints that then need to be mitigated, exactly. so you can go past mm -hmm. those and you can continue you know, on the careers that, mm. that women want to have. It's very interesting the way this conversation is going. It's almost as if, if we are really to have significant changes in the workplace, it has to start with changes in the home and in society. It's what Chin said, you need a kind of a cultural revolution. You need society <laughs> to change before the way we work changes, because it's all part of our lives. So let's, we're gonna go to the audience in a moment for some questions. Let's just eat a one, comment from each of you, starting with you, Justin Trudeau, what would have to change first if we are going to make 2016 the year when we're going to begin to close this gap even more? Uh, well, there's lots of things, but the thing I'll pick is that men have to be a big part of this conversation. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things, like, I'm uh, incredibly proud uh, to have a partner in my wife, Sophie, who is uh, extremely committed to women and girls' issues, but she uh, is, you know, we're of a like mind on, and I agree with her on, on that, and, and I've been very thoughtful about how we raise our daughter. Uh, but she caught me, yeah, or she <laughs> took me aside a few months ago and said, okay, uh, it's great that you're engaged and modeling to your daughter that you want her empowered and everything, but you need to take as much effort 
to talk to your sons, my eight-year-old boy and my two-year-old, so a little young still, uh, about how he treats women and how uh, he is going to be growing up to be a feminist just like dad. And by the way, we shouldn't be afraid of the word feminist. Yeah. Men and women mm. should use it to describe <laughs> themselves anytime they want. But that, that role we have uh, as men in supporting and demanding equality and demanding a shift uh, is really, really important. And there's lots of other things governments can do and we're trying to do, but, <laughs> <That's you. laughs> uh, but me personally as a, as a person and as a family member, yeah. Okay, so engage the men. Cheryl? Understand the motivation. We shouldn't be working towards equality just because it's the right thing. Exactly. We should do it because it's the smart thing. Mm. So from a company point of view or an organizational point of view, if you can use the full talents of the workforce, you're going to outperform. So whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're the most entry-level employee trying to outperform or the CEO, if you engage and really build diverse teams, you're going to outperform. So do it because it's going to help you. Similarly, in the home, we know that couples with more equal, heterosexual couples with more equal relationships have better, stronger relationships, lower levels of female depression, happier marriages, longer-term marriages, less divorce. We know that daughters and sons, but particularly daughters and, and sons too, of more active fathers, they do better. They do better emotionally, they have stronger relationships with their parents, um, they do better in school, and they do better professionally. Hmm. So the reason to work towards equality if you're a woman or a man is because it's going to help you. Yes. And, and that the, motivation will carry the us The arguments through. seem unassailable, which begs the question is why it's not happening. Melinda, what would you do? Well, one thing I want to bring up a point here is so that we're not just talking about high income settings or middle income mm. settings is one of the reasons we get to work as women is if we have access to contraceptives. And we mm. know, I mean, it's why women came into the workforce in droves in the United States. We're not as far as we need to be. But we have 220 million women that are asking us for them. Why? Not only are they healthy and their children's healthier, but if they can space the births of their children, they educate them, and then they can work in the workforce, the kids and the moms. So I want to keep that in mind, a part of this, if we're really about a global conversation. And the second thing I will just say in any country is role modeling. You don't change mindsets by just talking about things. Mm -hmm. You role model. So it's important for Prime Minister Trudeau to be here and to role model. It's important for my husband to role model. It's important for Mark Zuckerberg inside of Facebook to role model paternity leave so it's okay. So it takes women role modeling what's right, and it takes men role modeling what's right. It's going to take all of us doing that, and then expectations do change. Yeah, so, so I think we've talked about the case why. Cheryl, you talked about mm -hmm. the business case, the moral, and especially the business case why this is the right thing. Of course, the Prime Minister talks about the leadership, and the kind of leadership that you need to have to shift social norms, not the kind of leadership that waves it as one of the prime priorities. And then, of course, the supporting mechanisms, you know, the contraception, but child care, we see workforce participation rate varies, varies enormously depending on how robust and comprehensive child care support is, how easily accessible it is, and how affordable it is. Um, so to that then... Do you make uh, that possible for your employees? What is it, your record? Well, in, we operate in 80 countries, so in most of, in many of those countries, child support um, mechanisms exist and are provided for by the state. To the, and in those countries where it doesn't, we support our women leaders and employees to the degree that we're absolutely possible so that they can participate. And they always know that they can, can leave and then, and then come back. And how long is your maternity and paternity leave? It depends by country. So it is all legislated and, and uh, you know, as far as our policies are concerned, we always follow everything that, that we can so that our women are able to come back as quickly as they are able to. Well, we but I do for, think... For your employees in Canada know that we're improving and increasing. Yeah. We already have a good system yeah. better than the United yeah. States, not that that's saying much. Uh, but we've, uh, at, one of our commitments was to increase flexibility so that uh, both partners can share it better, uh, can, it can be uh, more parental leave over a shorter period of time with greater amounts or less amounts over a longer mm -hmm. period of time to allow for maximum flexibility to reflect the realities of families. I mean, that's, that's the big thing. The workforce is changing. Families' relationship to it is changing. Allow for flexibility, and that's one of the things we're working for. So, so but the, Jonas, the, the, I will, to steal Cheryl's phrase, yes. I hope you will lean in, <laughs> and you and other members of the global business elite will not just say, okay, Thailand's, oh, this is maternity leave in Thailand, this is maternity leave in China. You should say, this should be your maternity leave, because you know that they, the levels are not great in a lot and, of countries. And, for all of the countries and you're accepting are, it as a given. I am accepting yes. it as a given, and mm -hmm. no, I am promoting clearly the need to include as many people uh, into the workforce as possible, because that's the only way that those economies are going to grow. Mm -hmm. But I think from, from 
taking all of those as necessary but not sufficient actions from an organizational perspective to see women rise through the organization, the purposeful and deliberate um, uh, the, the, the purposeful and deliberate navigation of the kinds of roles that we want women to have will eventually, in the pipeline, determine what kind of roles they can ascend mm. to. So many women tend to be clustered in certain professions and or in certain functions. And we believe for there to be more female leaders at the helm of companies, and there are only 4% of, of uh, companies that are led by female CEOs, you need to make sure that you have women in technical roles, in, mm. in business roles, and P&L roles because you won't be able to make the shift late on in your career and, and just move over. You have to build a body of work and, 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 and performance and, of course, results within the areas that you would need if you're going to run a big organization. But and that create, has to and be... And create role models and that others and who create, join the company... Create, create role models, but, but it's not only about role models. It's enabling women to move into those roles and make it early and purposefully because... Mm -hmm. The, the social norms and the corporate culture and the expectations may work against that. So you have to work against that so that you're able to put more women in the pipeline for those kinds of roles. I'm sure you're going to change the company name. Jin, from you, one, what would you change from what you've seen? I, I believe in quotas. Quotas? I think quotas would be an effective way of breaking some of the old, long tradition and habits and bias. Mm. And I think that, you know, we talk about these gap in the numbers, the percentage, right? What if we have some quotas? Like the prime minister have a 50-50 quota. Mm -hmm. That's a quota, right? That, you know, he says this is 2015. <laughs> now, I don't know what's the right number for quota, but I think that would be an effective way of breaking the, the bias against women. That is being used in boardrooms. Norway started off, what is it, 40% in the boardroom? Some resist it, in some countries it's working. Melinda, does it work? Quotas? I think different countries are experimenting with different models. So Germany has a, a quota system now for boards. France does. Other ones like the UK mm -hmm. set a goal of where they wanted to go. <laughs> they actually got there quite quickly, and they had less of a stock market drop by saying it's the right thing to do. It's an expectation yeah. we have. Let's figure out how to fill the pipeline. They did it within four years. So I think you can experiment with different ways. But again, having it out there, having it in front, and saying what is our expectation helps a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. our, our largest province of Ontario uh, has a, a, an extraordinary uh, uh, homosexual female premier and uh, Premier Wynne uh, put forward uh, on corporate boards uh, just a simple uh, requirement uh, that they report explicitly their gender balance. Uh, that you say, you know, they're not going to tell you what to do, but we're going to say you have to let everybody know what your governance uh, gender balance is. And that puts a tremendous mm. amount of positive pressure uh, on people to do it without, uh, you know, having the, the calls that we're interfering or imposing. Just say, hey, if you want to justify it to your shareholders, uh, go ahead. The thing that's worth noting is quotas can be effective, and there are different countries and different models. They haven't been effective in moving the things which aren't quoted. So in Norway, there's been a 40% quota for women on boards and women in parliament for over 10 years. Mm. And they have 40% women on boards and 40% women in parliament. Do you know how many women run their top companies? 3.4%. Mm. Has not moved the numbers. Has not moved the numbers anywhere else in the corporation. And so... While they may be good in some circumstances, and I think each company and country needs to decide themselves, we can't rely on quotas because they're not moving the things which are not, they're not applied to. It's not trickling down. Hmm. Or the, up, yeah. The or other up. thing we're not even talking about on this panel is also, though, if you talk about this fourth industrial revolution, if you believe in a digital revolution, hmm. the technologies are coming, women are so underrepresented in yes. math and science and technology. In fact, when I went to college, I'm a computer science major, I didn't realize we'd reached the peak in the United States. 34% of women were coming out of college with a computer science degree. We're down to 17%. So if you want to say we're creating the new products for society that men and women and boys and girls are going to use, you have to get women to participate in those hmm. fields. So we have to do a lot more, even inside the foundation, when we want to fill a top science post, we don't let the recruiter just send us male resumes. In fact, we'll keep the resumes, we'll keep the interview loop open until we get enough good qualified women. That is not only role modeling, that's sponsoring, that's taking behavioral action. Guess what? We have fantastic women scientists inside the foundation because of that behavior and that action. Hmm. These are all really, really good points. And you know, just listening to everyone, it makes me think, you know what? I think this is the WEF panel that has the greatest chance of succeeding 
in what it sets out to do and why. Because all of you here, you may go to the panel about, say, the Fortune 500 or you know, taking care of climate change or solving the war in Syria. And you sit in your seat and you think, God, what, can I, what does that have to do to me? How can I stop the war in Syria? Well, look at what we're talking today. It begins in the home. It begins with every single one of us as mothers, fathers. It all begins with us in society. And the only way that by next year, if we come back and the gap will be closed, is that everyone starts thinking, right from the way, the way you raise your children, the way you interact with your colleagues and friends, the way you interact in the workplace, that, that is the only chance of this succeeding. Let me go to your questions. Please raise your hand, say who you are, unless you, your husband or your wife didn't know you're here and you don't want them to, to find out, <laughs> okay? The woman with her hand held highest, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, my name is Melissa. I'm a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, um, very well versed in some women's human rights. I first want to thank the WEF for putting this panel on the main stage. This wasn't here last year, and I very much appreciate it. Uh, my second question is that I wanted to call it the number that of the white badge delegates that are here at the WEF, the number is 18% are women. And I want people to just take a minute and look around this room and probably gauge the percentage of women that are in this room. It's over 50, maybe 60. And so my question would say, or would ask, um, you know, really, we need to have more men in this audience. And I know we talked about having men as part of this allyship and moving this needle, but how can we make this conversation past the people in this room so we're not preaching to the choir? Thank you. Yes. Keep the conversation going. Okay, who else had this woman in the front row? Don't worry, men, I'll get you. Eventually. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, first I'd like to thank you for the work that you're doing in terms of equ gender equality. But I'd like to issue a challenge and also an overlay. My name is Denise Bradley Tyson. I'm president of the San Francisco Film Commission, mm -hmm. uh, vice chair of the Tourism Diversity Committee for San Francisco, and an, an internet entrepreneur um, with a retail site trying to support women's cooperatives and artisans around the world. But the same conversation that we're having, you know, that feel excluded. As a woman, I feel um, you know, empowered by what we're trying to do, but as a person of color, and if we look at the numbers in mm. terms of people of color, particularly in the U.S., African Americans and Latinos, this is a whole nother conversation I think needs to be added to the agenda because those numbers are horrific when we think about the boardroom, the corporate um, heads of uh, corporate America. That's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it into the conversation. Okay, two women with their, held, their hands held high. One with nice gray hair, one with a gray scarf. Choose first. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Nadia Musaji. I'm a global shaper in the Cape Town Hub in South Africa. And my organization develops women engineers and girls in technology in different African Fantastic. countries. Fantastic. Well done. We want more of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Um, and a fantastic <laughs> selfie with Justin Trudeau in a pink hard hat. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and it brings back to the question around STEM. Um, and there was a question around the panel about girls not wanting to do engineering. And thank you very much for correcting that because as there's a lot of girls that do want to do engineering. And we've, there's been so many initiatives, both in Africa as well as in um, the US, but the needle's just not moving. So where do we need to start? And my dad joked once and he said, you've got a girl inch program to get more girls into engineering. Maybe you should start with Todd Inge to get toddlers oh. excited about engineering. Exactly. Is that where we, do, where we need to start? Exactly, you're absolutely right. Thank you, and thank you. We love those hats. Where can we get one? <laughs> Next week, we'll all be in pink hats. Um, I'm Ton Wright, a CEO of Equal Read, and I work to increase diversity in children's literature. Uh -huh. And I'm speaking up because I agree that there's so much that needs to happen in the home, and it's important that we all recognize that stereotype develops in children as early as two and a half, and that the environment is more powerful than family in establishing bias in children. And so it's essential that we think about what materials we're surrounding our kids with and that there is a density of cues that support inclusion in our society and especially in the classrooms. Thank you very much. There is a new movement now which is saying don't, uh, don't make toys gender specific. This poor man with trying to raise his hand high there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Federico Rivas and I'm a global shaper from the San Salvador hub and an oh. entrepreneur. Cheryl, I'm a huge fan of your book, Lean In, and I've given it uh, several times. And I actually like to offer, uh, I don't know if another man has started a movement, but 
I would personally like to offer myself to start Lenin in El Salvador, a country that needs more women to stop violence and to produce all sorts of amazing things. Now, I wanted to ask you on um, the role of legislation. Recently in Panama, a law has been passed that uh, requires that in the corporate boards, uh, there's a minimum percentage of women in it. So I wanted to know your perspective and also Minister Trudeau, um, if you're also looking to implement similar policies and, and what role policymaking should also have uh, to have more inclusiveness uh, of women, even at the highest levels mm. as well. Thank you. Yes. So, that is, please. Yeah, so I think, as I said before, quotas can be useful. They have not been shown to successfully move the things which they are not directly applied to. So it can be a useful tool, but it will never be sufficient. It can be one step that people can choose to take or not. And starting Lean In in El Salvador, we appreciate it. Mm -hmm. We have Lean In in El Salvador. So along with the book a couple years ago, started the foundation, uh, Lean In, and we help women and men set up Lean In circles, small groups that meet monthly to help people work towards gender equality. There are over 26,000 now in over 170 countries in the world, including El Salvador. And most importantly, 80% of the people that join one will say that they change something positive in their life in the first six months. Importantly, they've, we have a lot of partners. There are a lot of them in companies as well. Some of them are in the community, a lot on college campuses. We have very specific ones for computer science and engineering which Facebook and LinkedIn sponsored because we want to give a push to women in those fields. But also within companies where they can be a really useful tool to raise issues in an anonymous way. Because one of the challenges people have is a lot of the stuff we're talking about is unconscious bias. And it's both men and women mm. acting against women in leadership. But it's stuff that's really hard to raise because it feels small. And these are the paper cuts that keep women from getting all the way to the top. What the circles do is they provide an anonymous way where people are able to say, well, in my circle, we heard X. And they're able to raise those issues without having to take on their direct manager, which should go well and doesn't always. And it can raise those issues in a very uh, communal way. And so I hope you start them in your company. We'll certainly help you. But it's all up for free on leanin.org. Thank you. Mr. Trudeau, your question is interesting because if change is to come about, how much of it does have to come from governments? That you actually legislate, make not just quotas in the workplace, but actually legislation which says you have basically you have to do this, or it's good for you to do it. Well, different governments will make different choices, and I mentioned uh, the Ontario example, but. On my personal example, yes, uh, there's one board I got to appoint, and I chose uh, that the cabinet be 50-50. But I also appoint, uh, as government, as prime minister, uh, thousands of positions across the government. And we have made it very, very explicit uh, that uh, you know, gender balance and diversity as well. Uh, not just for its own sake, but because uh, you're getting better decision making, you're better getting a uh, governance that reflects the reality of the broad population you're supposed to serve. Uh, so being conscious and mindful and consistent in uh, pushing this, not because you have to or because there's legislation, but because you're getting better quality of service for citizens out of it, uh, is at the center of our approach. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit of confidential, confidential information with us, because it is Davos after all? The, the, the charge that's often made when you say, okay, 40% of the board has to be women, and in the clubs and in the bars, the men say, oh, where are they going to find all those women? They're going to choose women because they're women. They don't, they're not qualified. When you were choosing your 50-50 cabinet, when you were choosing your board, were you lying awake at night and thinking, where am I going to find the qualified women? Was, was, there, was there a problem, or did you actually have too many women to there, choose? There was a problem because the extraordinary women who ran for us uh, I, you know, were, there were too many. There are great women who so aren't the in problem, cabinet. Is it more rather there are great men uh, who aren't in cabinet as well because we, we, uh, we, we were deliberate about getting it small. But like I said, the, the groundwork we had to do to get to where we could have uh, the kind of cabinet we have and convincing people to run for politics, con convincing mm -hmm. women to run for politics was tremendous. I want to share a story uh, that really, really uh, touched me and touched everyone sitting around the cabinet table. We're not supposed to talk about what happened at cabinet, but uh, Don't tell anyone. two Don't extraordinary tell anyone. women, uh, our health minister, uh, turned to uh, Maryam Monsef, our, uh, our democratic institutions uh, minister, after an intervention that she had made on Syria, 
uh, and on the Syrian refugees. And Miriam herself uh, came to Canada as a 10-year-old girl, uh, refugee from Afghanistan, and now she's 30 year old and, and in cabinet. And uh, Jane, our health minister, uh, simply looked and said, I, while hearing you speak, all I could think of is, uh, right now, there's a 10-year-old girl in a Syrian refugee camp mm. who could be sitting around this table in Canada in 20 years. And that story and that, that sharing how we're creating a transformative governance by reaching out and bringing people in in every way you can uh, is what we have to do much more of mm. in our communities, in our businesses, in our lives. You know, and we should just highlight one of the points which you've, which you've made a few times now in hinting at something, which is women say, I'm not sure I want that kind of work. For example, in the British Parliament, you know, the big push to get more women parliamentarians, they said, we don't like the fact that the sessions go on till midnight. We don't like the fact that everyone retires to the bar. I mean, men say that as well. But when women are looking at work, they're also looking at the quality of work. It's not, sometimes it's not just that the women aren't there for the jobs. The women say, actually, that's not something I want to be part of. So we've talked about changing the home, but we also have to change the way work is managed. It can't take over your life. You're, you're, you're mentioning There's a lot of things which have to change. It's not simply, oh, there's a great job and put a great woman in it. You have to make sure that is a job that brings a human way of working. Am, am I? This, Absolutely, and I think, but that's why if you get women into those role models, they're going to question the social norms. Exactly. They're going to say, this isn't acceptable for men or women. Exactly. Do we value work? Yes. Do we value family? Yes. Does society have it backwards right now? Yes. It has to be, we keep talking about work-life balance, but if we have all these work practices that don't support the balance of the family, you're going to get this unequal distribution. So you have to do the right things. What, what, Prime Minister Trudeau is talking about is role modeling in such an important way because it will get other countries to say, at my cabinet level, why can't I have 50 percent? Well, can I do what he did to get that done? Women will look up and go, all of a sudden, I see on that cabinet lots of different styles of female leadership. Not, I may not look like the health minister, I may not look like this minister, but wow, I could be a great person on a cabinet. Role modeling is critical in mm. all of these industries. And then once you get the women there, they start to make the change. Exactly. Mm. Jonas, Jonas yeah, is having would, full of uh, ideas today, Jonas. And this you know, the, the, so clearly the social norms will have to shift in society as well as in organizations. And you know, the, the, the benefit of recruiting to the uh, can, Canadian cabinet is probably then not mirrored exactly in the efforts that organizations have to make to bring women leaders in all through, uh, through their ranks because we know that women leaders are, are far and few between and most CEOs would say, you know, when, we, when it came to that time, we looked around and there were no women that were suitable for the role. And I think as you look at the talent pipeline, you have to realize that a man looking at a, a job, and this goes back a little bit to your aggression, the, the perception of what is going to be said, even if the likelihood of a man is going to be, you know, two percent of succeeding in a role, exactly. if you ask him if he's going to succeed, the answer is, "I will do exactly. this. I will do this so well. You have no idea how well this is going to go." <laughs> yes, and, the women and in say, many well, cases, like, unfortunately, you know, women with the same question who have just as much capability mm -hmm. and skill to do this job, they'll say, "Well, you know, I'm not really sure, <laughs> and you know, I have these concerns." And when that gets played back, the feedback is. You know, she wasn't really ready. She so, didn't yeah. really it's want so to do it. And unless we change the cultural mindset, we understand that there are, there are break points within women's careers where you need to have supporting mechanisms in society and within organizations. And unless you can understand that these are the moments where you really need to push and you really need to not exactly. only have a solid pipeline, but you need to understand the language being used and what's being said and really, really probe and then push mm. beyond because otherwise, you will get the same answer, and, and the business case is evident. The distribution of men and women is 50% in the world's population. So if that isn't happening, mm. we must go to more pragmatic solutions and be very, very deliberate in our efforts to make this change. There's a lot of data behind what you're saying. So women are systematically underestimated in terms of their performance compared to men, starting with babies crawling. Mothers will systematically overestimate their sons crawling and underestimate their daughters. When you survey people on objective criteria, GPA sales quotas, women will get there slightly low and men will get there slightly high. 
We also attribute success differently in men or women. When men succeed, we, meaning the person and other people, attribute that success to the man's core skills. Hmm. He succeeded because he was great. He has skills. Right. With women, we attribute that success, both themselves and others, to working hard help from others and getting lucky. That's a really big difference. And this explains why men put themselves up for promotion at higher rates and are promoted at higher rates. Men are promoted based on potential and women are promoted based on what they've already proven. And so we have to understand that systematic bias. That's right. That systematic bias also exists on race. In the United States, we will systematically bias towards, towards the majority rather than the minority. A white sounding name on a resume over a black sounding name on a resume is worth eight years, eight years of job experience in terms of how many interviews you get mm. called back for. So just understanding these biases, this explains some of the things that we have to overcome right. in order to get there. As I say in Britain, mind the gap. Gender gap, confidence gap, color gap. Let's close the gaps. The lady with the nice black glasses. Hi, um, I'm Alanda. I'm a global shaper from the Jakarta Hub, in Indonesia, and I also organize Indonesia's biggest youth conference. And my question would be, Indonesia is a country um, who already had a female head of state before the United States, after 70 years of independence. But it's also a country where there are religious values that say that once you get married, a woman has to serve the men, for example. I want to ask the question for Prime Minister Trudeau, as a leader of a country that has multicultural and multi-faith, how do you plan to encourage people, especially women, to embrace gender parity agenda mm. without compromising religious values that they have upheld for so many years? Thank Very you. Very good question. Thank you. You I are a global shaper. <laughs> uh, for me, I think it has to do with understanding that we have to uh, shift actions quickly and understand that sometimes mindsets take longer to shift. Uh, I, I have tremendous confidence when I look at uh, the diversity uh, in our uh, elementary and high schools, for example, how people uh, learn from each other, how people understand that, that values of their parents and grandparents uh, might not be uh, suited uh, or fully adapted or fully uh, functioning within uh, our modern pluralistic diverse society, but that doesn't make them uh, have to reject uh, their pride in family and place and origin. It just means that we're constantly challenging to update social mores and cultures uh, so that we, we shift. I mean, even within our own society, if you look back uh, 50 years or if you leaf through a, a, a magazine from the 70s, uh, you see you know, horrific sexism that is overt in a way that uh, would be unacceptable today. Well, even today, uh, hopefully 20 years from now, people will look back at what we thought was acceptable today and find it horrifically off base. So you have to understand that cultures are constantly shifting. You have to to respect people's faith, but also say we share public values of respect, of openness, of equality, uh, and that's those are the rules of the game in a free society, not just on a moral level, but if we want to be successful as a strong, diverse uh, country and community, uh, we have to make sure we're working very hard and thoughtfully at that. Thank you. My name is Basim Awadallah. I'm from Jordan. I worked for the government of Jordan for many years. Uh, one of the reasons, in my opinion, for the underdevelopment of the Arab world and the problems that we see in the Arab countries today is the lack of participation of women. And that is distinct, obviously. In, in the global parity, you can see that very clearly. I believe that countries must reform and must reform quickly if they are going to avert the dangers, not only local dangers, but global dangers. And if they're going to stop producing refugees by, by, by the thousands and the hundreds of thousands and the millions in the years to come. Reform needs to be indigenous, but I believe that governments and corporations can incentivize reform in the Arab countries. I believe that reform will never happen unless it is somehow encouraged. And I would just ask if Prime Minister Trudeau, who has tremendous uh, popularity in the Arab world for what he has so courageously done for the refugees, a company like Facebook, the foundation, the Gates Foundation, all other companies, even China and the government of China, if they can actually help introduce uh, or encourage mm -hmm. Arab governments to legislate, to find ways for women to participate. Because unless women participate in the Arab world, we're not going to have functioning countries across the Arab world. 
Thank, Thank you, Basim. Thank you very much. Okay, we've just got time for maybe two questions. Lovely purple turban. Please stand up. He's a Global Shaper too? Yeah. My God, you guys rock. Hi, I'm Jaydeep. I'm a Global Shaper from Chandigarh in India. And I'm involved in the electrification of the remotest communities of India. My, my, I have two things. One is a comment. We, uh, throughout the forum, I've attended many sessions on gender parity. And always the discussion is around why we need more women in the workforce. It is justified with numbers. Why, why are we still doing that in 2016? Why do we need to justify why more women will add more value to the workforce? Why don't we talk about how about leaving the 30% unproductive men outside of the company and maybe get more better results? So that's a comment that I have. And my question is, we are talking about women, we, we are talking about blacks, whites, Christians, Muslims, Sikhs. Why don't we talk about inclusion of human beings? Mm -hmm. Let's stop the discussion around gender. Let's talk the discussion about religion, caste, creed. Let's talk about including human beings. What can we make to include a human being in our workforce? What can we do to include a human being in our education system? Why can't we talk about those things? Very good point, very point. We only have time for one last question and it should go to the girl with the red shoes in the front row. <laughs> Who I think is also a global shaper. <laughs> Not only my global shaper, I just want to thank my friend Nadia. She actually got her selfie with Mr. Justin Trudeau. I was moderating and didn't get one, so <laughs> I'll try to get you outside. Um, my name is Jimena Nalfal. I'm a news producer and anchor based in Beirut, Lebanon, and oh. I uh, want to echo what the gentleman was saying about how in the Middle East women still struggle to make an impact and are very much uh, put down and belittled when they do. And I want to ask, um, because I I host a series on inspirational women. I want to ask everybody in the panel if you could give a piece of advice, because I know sometime during when you were struggling to make it happen, uh, there must have been somebody who advised you. If you could give that piece of advice to these women uh, who are watching, what would it be? Okay, we are now out of time, but since we should work overtime for women, we're just going to take a few minutes more, and we will end with your question about how to inspire young women, and also a nod to what needs to be done in the Arab world and also in the boardroom. To you, Tin. Um, inspire young women. I mean, I think that uh, I like Cheryl's lean-in groups. I actually started a BG club, big girl club. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened is uh, one year when uh, Christine Lagarde came to Beijing and uh, we wanted, she wanted to host a, a, a women's dinner, so I had uh, organized a group of women together, and ever since, that was the basis of the BG Club, and now we're e expanding. So I find this kind of a women's group uh, supporting each other, sharing the ideas, and, you know, and, and in, also inviting uh, inspiring speakers to come in. Those are role models really helpful. I think that would be small things that everyone can do. You, can, you all have some friends and start some kind of a lean-in group. Thank you. Jonas? Well, we've, we've talked about you know, the unconscious and the conscious biases that ex exist in the mm. workplace, and a lot of, there's always a lot of discussion around the mentorship, and I know this is a little bit semantic, but to me, mentorship appears to be the way to mitigate a male-driven conscious or unconscious bias so that women are able to survive and don't leave the company. So I think women should look for sponsors instead of mentors. Sponsors are individuals that are willing to put themselves out there, take a risk with somebody who may say that they're not ready and push them and move them into a position and also help them navigate some of the times that are going to be more difficult. Uh, and, and I'd like to see that shift occur and that would be my advice. Don't look for a mentor, look for a sponsor. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with that more. With mm. both of these comments, and I'm gonna add one more, which is not just mentorship, it's absolutely sponsorship. And I will say about women's group, I see them at all levels of society. I see them at the village level in India, I see them in Bangladesh, I see them at high levels at corporate boards, I see women in the workplace, that when you gather together, there's a strength in standing together and say, this is what we're going to do, and you have each other's backs when you do it. Then you can go say, these are my rights, of course I'm a human being, of course I get to participate in this. But you have one another as strength and support. And the second thing I would say, 
is if you are a male in this room, and I think somebody asked earlier, what can we do? Get 10 men that you know who believe in women and get them to publicly speak about it. When our foundation was first formed and was being um, talked about in the press, Warren Buffett got asked about Bill's participation in Bill's foundation. And he said, I won't answer those press questions unless it's about Bill and Melinda. They are doing this equally. I've been asked here numerous times about Mark Zuckerberg's new initiative with his foundation at this forum, and I say it's not about Mark. It's about Mark and Priscilla. We have to all talk about this publicly, raise up women. And the other last thing I'll say about role models, what's the biggest predictor of whether a girl will go into a STEM field? whether her father believes in her. Mm. That is the biggest predictor. I didn't realize it. I went into computer science. My dad was an engineer because he had female mathematicians and engineers always on his team. And he believed my sister and I could be good in math and science. So what do I do at home to redistribute the workload when Bill was CEO of Microsoft and I was choosing to be home for a few years? Guess what? On Saturday mornings, I wanted to sleep late. So you know what I did? I made sure there were science projects available, and that's what he did with our two daughters and our son. And guess what my two daughters are interested in? Science and math. Hey. Great. Great. Lean in circles, support each other. No one can do this alone. But coming together in small groups of any form, particularly where men and senior men are involved, then we can change society. Hmm. Um, uh, yes to all that, uh, <laughs> but when we think about why we want more uh, women in politics, more women in boards, it's because we want to shift uh, boards to be better at governance, at less uh, conflict, uh, aggressive, ego-driven. We want politics to be less like that. Let's start rewarding companies and politicians who aren't driven by a macho ego uh, approach uh, and support people who take a much more respectful, conciliatory, uh, open and inclusive approach uh, and model that to everyone, men and women. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we, for a greater future, we need great fathers, we need great feminists. We need also the passion, the inspiration, and the insights of a panel like you. Prime Minister Trudeau, you will this year change Canada's rating on global gender gap for report for the World Economic Forum in the rankings about political participation with your cabinet. When you come back next year, we hope that Canada's rating will be greater <laughs> when it comes to employment and opportunities in the workplace. And I will close by picking up on the comment from the Global Shaper with that great uh, purple turban and saying the best way to do it is to emphasize the human. Because you know what? The most human value of all is to treat men and women, boys and girls equally. Go out and do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for attending this session.